<clears throat> all right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining, and thanks um, all of um, all the folks who uh, managed to help set this up. This it is good fun. Um, what essentially we'll be talking about today is uh, securing uh, Kubernetes clusters. Now, what Stephen went through is how do you you know get a cluster up and running and um, operational on AWS. Operational is something I use loosely given the demo. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I, like, I liked you, Scott, and I liked you, Pratik. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, no, but uh, in all fairness, like what Stephen did is it's absolutely what everyone does. Bringing up that cluster, you smash out some Terraform. Um, you know, once you have that Terraform, or maybe you are using EKS or CloudFormation is your poison, you smash that out. Uh, get your YAMLs, plug it in, and you have a, a cluster up and running. One thing, unfortunately, that does get missed, and I've seen that in multiple uh, organizations, and again, this is from my experience, um, is uh, security is, is kind of like an afterthought. Um, unfortunately, with Kubernetes, it's a problem. So let's just quickly get into it. Uh, by the way, yeah, um, my name is Pratik Naik, and please, if you... If, if you folks have any question around any of the Kubernetes stuff or all any of this, LinkedIn and Twitter is the way to go. Follow, ask questions, ask away. I will happily reply. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. A little bit of uh, about Enabler. We are um, a, a Melbourne-based consultancy, uh, trying mostly specializing in you know helping folks uh, build cloud-native infrastructure, if you will, or cloud-native uh, transformation journeys, if you will. All the buzzwords. I'll leave that to marketing. This is the interesting part. In, interesting part. So um, I, Stephen covered this uh, very well, and I think uh, the need for Kubernetes, and it's it's because there's uh, with this whole modern architecture where people are breaking their monoliths into microservices, to in some cases going to extreme extents, breaking them into nano services. All of that results in a lots and lots of containers, which need you know uh, orchestration engines like Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is very good in doing what it does. Uh, it's a it's a very good orchestration management and scheduling uh, scheduling engine. But by default, any vanilla Kubernetes that you install, like be it by yourself or on some of the cloud providers, even their vanilla installs, they're not secure by default. Um, that's an unfortunate position because there's a lot of thing that goes on in making Kubernetes secure. And when when I was uh, building out this talk. Uh, one, I would like to apologize. There are no demos today, unfortunately. Um, I wasn't able to get a uh, uh, like an evil account uh, or evil cluster working properly. Um, so there are no demos. But when I was thinking about what I should present, there were a couple of ways I could have gone. Either talk about very few things um, and uh, go in very depth of those things or talk about some of my really uh, broad spectrum experiences that I've had with customers or clients on in Kubernetes. Um, and give you pointers so that you can, you all can go and read up on those. And if you are starting on your Kubernetes journey or you're, or you're already running in production, maybe just go and read up and validate uh, um, uh, some of the some of the uh, you know concerns that we talk about today. Um, I just saw in chat. Is there an issue with audio? Can people hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, man. Cool. All good. All good. Um, so yeah, and the other thing is, given Kubernetes is, uh, is popular and everybody is on Kubernetes, there are new attack vectors. People are actively looking for new attack vectors, trying to figure out. There's a lot of research that is going on. I don't know if you folks uh, folks follow um, any of the conferences in in the states around RSAs or whatever. There's a there's a really good amount of content that goes around securing Kubernetes. Uh, especially some of the speakers like Ian Goldwater or Duffy Cooley, they've got really good content on it. Would definitely recommend watching out those conferences. But uh, to sum it up, the last uh, the, the 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 couple of points that are on that slide, that container escape uh, vulnerability or exploit, it's it's actually a sad reality. It can happen if you don't you know protect your customers. And you you folks might have heard previously like. Uh, um, a few, I think it was a couple of years ago or a year ago, Tesla got owned and their, their clusters got Bitcoin mined and everything as well. Um, the other aspect to Kubernetes is when you're building an application and, and think from this, think of this from a development perspective, right? When you're building out an application, um, there's, there's really not much thought that goes on to some of the security elements of it. It's, it's always about, I want to churn my feature out 
I want to churn uh, the best quality of code or the code needs to have unit testing, integration testing, all of that. But security kind of, I, I'm not saying that nobody does it, but it's, it's, it's kind of such an afterthought that sometimes it gets overlooked. Um, and there's this, this scary word cloud that people miss. Like you don't have proper observability. You don't think about uh, firewalls, DR scenarios, and all of that. And I know some of this loosely doesn't tie to uh, security, but it's loosely related. And I'll walk, talk about this in general. Um, so with that problem space in mind, uh, let's have a look at some of the ways, um, you know, Kubernetes can A, natively solve it, or you can use some native objects in Kubernetes, um, and B, uh, some of the open source tooling that you can leverage. Now, I've deliberately tried to keep it a slightly high level, didn't go into much, much technical depth, uh, but as, as Steven said before, if need be, we can definitely do a follow-up where we can, you know, deep dive on some of these aspects do a little bit of demo here and there. Steven and I can do it together, stand up a cluster and maybe hack it. Um, but let's let's look at some of the you know, native uh, Kubernetes stuff. Um, so very first is the authentication and authorization model. If you are standing up, um, yep, that's the link for Tesla. Um, if you are standing up a Kubernetes cluster today, think of these things. If you are part of that, either a platform team or sysadmin team that is standing up Kubernetes uh, for your, um, uh, an organization, think of these things. Enable API authentication from the get-go of it. Uh, disable some of the traditional or legacy ways of authentication, like AVAC, disable um, uh, certificates and all of that. Like go to more, um, you know, integration with your existing, if you have one, existing ADFS or maybe any SAML provider or OIDC provider you can. Um, and again, all of this, all of the content that we're going to talk about today is from my actual experience. I've worked with multiple clients in helping them build the Kubernetes um, uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, one of the, the second one is actually a very surprising one. People get caught off guard is, uh, unfortunately, the Kubelet API um, is by default allowed for anonymous access. Um, so if you hit the Kubelet API directly, it's, it's unauthenticated. You have to chuck in a flag when you stand up your Kubernetes saying your Kubelet always uh, are not uh, enable false. Um, this, although some of you might know this already, but this is not common knowledge. Um, and this got picked up when I built, like a couple of years ago when I built a Kubernetes cluster, this got picked up by a pen tester. Oh, oh man, that report was not funny. Um, but anyway, so and also, yeah, disable ABAC. Nobody uses ABAC. RBAC is the way to go. Um, then if, if you are hosting your clusters on, let's say, a cloud provider, and most of the cloud providers support this today, but if you are on a cloud provider like AWS or Google, they, they all have a means of integrating their identity with Kubernetes. Um, so for instance, uh, um, uh, Google has a thing called workload identity, where you can provision a Google service account and use that service account from a Kubernetes service account. All you have to do is do that binding. What that lets you do is you're not, a, first of all, you're not uh, uh, taking credentials into your cluster. There's no credentials stored in the cluster. And B, um, you have, like, you can do least privileges, least privileged service accounts. Um, generally, in the past, when things like the, that didn't exist, you would have those um, credentials attached to your node. And your node will have God mode permission, and all of a sudden, things can, you know, break and, oh, you, People do funny things when they go have God mode. Um, last one, they are part of uh, a, the uh, they are part of the admission controllers. To be honest, the node rest restriction is definitely part of an admission controller. But what that what that means is uh, node restriction and node uh, authorization is um, if you don't have node rest restriction enabled, Kubelet can uh, modify some of your nodes uh, labels. Um, those specifically the node restriction labels. And let's just say you are in a very tightly regulated environment or you have a strict compliance requirement and you've siphoned off or you've sectioned off your cluster into multiple node pools and you've got various nodes um, serving as one function, other nodes serving as another function. What you would want to do is label them so that you can deploy certain pods to them. This is a very common way of you know, no, tainting your nodes or no, label selecting your nodes. Um, what you want 
uh, you, what you don't want actually is Kubelet all of a sudden modifying those labels or you know modifying those uh, uh, restriction labels on the nodes. If you do that, your pods won't be scheduled or they will be scheduled somewhere where you don't intend to do. So recommendation is have a look at this, read through it. There's a lot of detail in that, how you can go about uh, you know, enabling that. So that's one bit and advice from this slide, look at authentication and authorization entirely for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, make the workflow easier for your development teams if, if you operate in that fashion. Next one, and this, I think this is my favorite uh, part of Kubernetes security. Again, this is not a specifically a security tool, RBAC, but what RBAC is, it's a very strong model on Kubernetes where you can actually uh, create perfect team silos on the clusters. Like if you have one giant, or if you have a shared cluster or you, or you have a one big cluster where multiple teams are operating, you can actually leverage RBAC to your advantage where you use a section of that cluster for individual teams um, and then service accounts as well. You can create as many as you want, least privileged service account either tied to let's say your workload identities or they could do any uh, operations within the cluster. But always have that thing ingrained. Think about least privilege. What is the minimum privilege a service account or a user needs to perform any action or perform, any, perform their responsibilities? Um, Something that I've learned uh, with Kubernetes is the default rules that generally come out of the box, they are a bit uh, permissive and they don't really cater for uh, um, uh, like the various use cases. So my recommendation always is create custom roles, role bindings for yourselves on your cluster. Um, don't rely on the, class, uh, uh, the default roles. I think the default roles are cluster admin, edit, and read only. Those are the three. Um, but T, just a question for me. How do you find people split those roles out, right? Is it, is it based on functional? Like, how are you seeing people really split them out? Because the cluster cluster admin roles, the default ones, mm -hmm. are very infrastructure focused. Right? Yeah. Whereas if you rock over into a real world deployment, you mm -hmm. end up with more line of business focus. So how are you? seeing those roles in the real world be split out just from your experience and yes, in on. chat feel free to chime in no spot on and i think that is a very interesting question thanks for that uh, because I've, 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 I've had to solve that in every single organization i've went and, and consulted around kubernetes so uh, one of the principles that i go for is first of all we remove all of these uh, if we if we set aside all of these default roles uh, look at all the teams or all the folks that are going to use um, the cluster. And there are two ways of uh, segmenting um, RBAC roles or groups, if you will. One is it could be very team focused. You can go on dividing your cluster uh, groups and roles based on individual teams that are going to consume that. Or it could be very application focused or project focused. So if there is an application suite, a collection of applications, um, then you can form a group around that and multiple teams can collaborate on that um, on that particular team-based uh, group. Now, within the team-based group as well, you want multiple layers of roles. Um, so you will have, uh, so what I've done in the past is, let's say there's a team X and you're creating a group for that team X. Um, you might want to look at a couple of roles in there like uh, team X SRE, Team X developers and Team X um, read only. Um, and you might not be limited to that. There might be other options as well, or there might be other permutations in combination too. So there, it really depends on how you want to, or what kind of team you're uh, working with, but that's kind of a very high level uh, breakdown, if you will. I don't know if that helps or answers yeah, your question. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. I'm just really wondering what people are doing, you know, because. I know I've seen a few that are infrastructure heavy. I've also seen a few that are um, team and sort of line of business focused almost, mm -hmm. right? The teams being aligned to the line of business, but they they control the whole stack for that yeah. line of business, right? And that might be the persistent volume API all the way up to the application, right? It's infrastructure, yeah. it's application, it's everything, right? So. Yeah, no, spot on. And yeah, it, it's really, I think, uh, very use case dependent on what you want to solve for or how, or how the organization is divided. 
but yeah you can think about some of the ways of dissecting that is you know maybe an sre kind of a role maybe a developer kind of or engineer kind of a role and then a read only role and then you start grouping them per teams or per application stack but yeah that that's actually a very valid question um cool moving on yeah so one last thing on this page that i would say is uh, by default um, kubernetes has this thing called service account auto mounting um, so if you create a pod, it will mount the default service account and it may be okay for you, your use case, but have a look at that. Generally, I recommend disable that kind of a feature and, you know, create specific service accounts per deployment, if you will. Um, but yeah, something to keep in mind. So overall, from this slide, my takeaway is um, explore RBAC to, to, its, uh, to its full potential and go in depth of um, how you can leverage it um, a, to follow the principle of least privilege, but B, also to segregate your permissions on your cluster. Cool. Um, next one. Yeah, so this one is more around um, one thing that I generally recommend to clients is like Vanilla, Vanilla Kubernetes has uh, um, by default many admission controllers enable. And what admin, so for the folks who are you know new to Kubernetes, what an admission controller is, when you do a kubectl um, apply or when you try to deploy something to your kubernetes cluster as uh, steven was trying to do if you have an admission controller deployed um, what it will do is after the authorization happens after you've authenticated and then authorized yes you can do this there's a, a bunch of checks and balances that take place and each of the admission controller kind of gets triggered um, and let's just say I have an admission controller, which is a kind of a validation admission controller, and you are trying to apply a deployment.yaml. And my admission controller is saying, whenever somebody creates a deployment, look for uh, the name. The name should make sense, or it should be something compliant with my strategy or whatever. What will happen is as soon as you push apply that deployment, after your authentication and authorization, that deployment object actually goes to this admission controller, Admission controller then does whatever it has to do and comes back with a yay or nay. If it has, if it is passes that admission controller, then it goes into your etcd where it gets persisted. And once it is persisted, that's when your Kubernetes controllers take over and try to, you know, do what you've asked them to do. But admission admission controller, pretty much like what the name says, what it says on the team, it's it's a controller for your admission. It can block or allow your admission into the cluster. Um, now, there are various types of admission controllers. Some are, some are called validating, some are called mutating, and mostly all the controllers are both. Um, but the ones that I want to call out on this screen are uh, the pod security policy admission controller, very, very important. And we'll talk about that in next few slides. Um, and the security context deny controller as well. Uh, what that what the security context deny controller does is if you have that enabled and you've configured it uh, in a fashion and let's say when I push my deployment.yaml uh, one of the items of configuration is security context and if that doesn't match it match to your con uh, to my configuration that deployment will be rejected and it will not be allowed to go through into the cluster very very important all of this uh, because you don't want, uh, you know, mani malicious actors who are who somehow somehow got access to your APIs, creating in their own deployments, running Bitcoin miners or whatever. Like, I mean, there are other ways of doing it as well, but this definitely get gets rid of the novices who just you know kubectl apply a Bitcoin miner kind of a um, attack. So take away from this slide. Um, please go and explore, read about admission controllers if you are building a production grid. Um, a Kubernetes cluster, there is no reason to not install any um, uh, of these admission controllers. This will definitely, definitely save you a lot of time and hassle. Um, these are controllers. Uh, you can build your own admission controllers as well. Oh, I would. Um, no, actually, I take it back. Uh, Admission controls, these are uh, predefined and are open API. I have to check how you can do your well uh, own defined. I think you can. I have to double check that. That's a very good question. I'll take a note of that. Um, 
All right, sorry. Yeah, moving on, sir. Uh, the the port security policy um, controller that we spoke about previously is one of the most fundamental security. Um, um, what's it called? A, a, a tool, if you will. And this is like a native. PSPs are like native uh, Kubernetes objects, right? Um, what you can do, and on the right hand side, I've actually got a sample PSP. This is straight out from the Kubernetes docs. Um, and in the diagram, what we're trying to show is a PSP can prevent pods from starting in uh, privilege escalation mode. They can, you can limit what volumes you can mount in the cluster. Now, for some of us, it might be like, why would I want to limit any volumes that are mounted to my cluster? And this is not talking about PVCs and PV. This is just uh, mounting directly into the pod, like your uh, secrets or your config maps or you know host path um, uh, mounts. The reason you would want to do this is uh, to a degree you want to disallow mounting host paths on your container and specifically paths like slash etc or slash var slash logs because if you mount those paths um, and somehow a container gets exploited and I want to escape and I escape in that path, that will become a very, very, uh, it's, it's very es easy to escape if you mount some of those sensitive paths. Um, the other other use cases for PSPs are you can uh, if you see on the top top of this YAML file there's seccomp and app armor those are Linux security modules. Um, generally, people don't I mean they they're not that common yet, but they are a good way of providing that defense um, uh, to your pods. What these Linux security modules let you do is um, you can drop certain Linux capabilities. You can um, restrict what syscalls you can make. You can do a whole lot of things and just make your pods really concise and tightly secured. The use case that we're trying to prevent here is that whole container escape or container exploit. So if you are running, let's say you're running an API, um, which is publicly exposed, and somehow let's just, for the sake of it, say that the coding practices are not that good, there's a vulnerability in the code, or there's a vulnerability in the shared library or whatever, there are multiple ways I can, uh, people can um, get into that uh, container and then exploit the vulnerability. If you run something like PSPs to a degree, you can restrict what they can do even if they've exploited that container's vulnerability. Um, I'm not saying this is the one solution for protecting you, but this is a very, very good uh, um, uh, protection mechanism. Um, next one is, oh, sorry. Yeah, so my uh, takeaway from this slide is please have a uh, have a look at PSPs, explore PSPs. One caveat with PSPs though, when you enable PSPs on your cluster, make sure you have a cluster role bindings and role bindings created alongside it uh, or else it will start failing. Um, it, it will start failing some of your pods and it might not take effect as you expect it to. So there's a bit of understanding of PSPs, how you should uh, go about them, but heavily, heavily recommend uh, exploring P PSPs uh, for your security posture. Um, the next one is network policies. Again, this is these are all my experiences of, and what I'm sharing. So network policies is, is an interesting one as well. Like by default in Kubernetes, when you deploy application or when you deploy your pods, all pods can talk to each other. Like there is no traffic segmentation. Traffic is all allowed. And in some cases, you know what, that might be okay. But in some cases, if you are running, you know, clusters for, uh, uh, let's say, a, a financial organization or any organization that has very strict requirements on data access or, um, you know, uh, who accesses what, just from a security standpoint, you can actually leverage network policies to do proper traffic segmentation. And what I mean by that is, let's say there's a container called DB container, not recommending that you should run a database on Kubernetes, but let's just say for the sake of argument, there's a MySQL DB container and there's an API that fronts, and there's an API container that fronts that DB layer and there's an Nginx or a reverse proxy in front of that API. You do not want, and this is again, one-on-one security, right? You do not want the Nginx or the reverse proxy directly going to your database. In some cases, you may want to, but ideally speaking, you do not want. Um, in native Kubernetes or vanilla Kubernetes, there's no way of just protecting that. 
um, you can leverage network policies to uh, to to achieve that traffic segmentation. Um, you can do multiple labels and multiple label selectors. As you can see on the screen, I've got a sample network policies. Again, this is straight out of the bat from the Kubernetes documentation as well. Uh, you can do crazy, crazy things with that. Like you can, first, you can start from just isolating namespaces. So if you want two namespaces isolated from each other in terms of network traffic, you can do that just using labels on those uh, namespaces. Or if you want a very specific pod uh, uh, targeted, you can do a label selector on that pod as well, as you can see on the, um, on the YAML. And you can do source and destination filtering um, very effectively with these. Um, now, out of the box, most of the CNIs do support uh, network policies. Um, I, I don't remember. Oh, Flannel was the one where we had to use Calico a, long, a while back. But definitely explore uh, things like play, or CNIs uh, like Calico or authorization uh, like Calico. Calico is really good. I love Calico because you can do a crazy, crazy networking rules and global networking rules. Um, and it, it has got a good logging framework as well. And, um, oh, yeah. The last point on this slide as well with network policies. So if you are operating in a cloud environment, uh, there all the cloud operators do this. They have like a 169254 metadata endpoint uh, where you can go and ask for temporary credentials or get security credentials. I think that is one of the the the, the most common exploits that I have heard or seen um, in terms of when people attempt, because whenever they break into something, they're like, oh, can I hit the metadata endpoint and grab some credentials? My recommendation is you can leverage network policies to black block sorry black block traffic going to those endpoints as well. Um, uh, have a look into it if you are on Google or AWS. Definitely you can do that. I'm not hundred percent. I'm not sure about Azure. Um, if you can or if it has a consistent metadata API either. But yeah, you can definitely uh, do that on AWS and Azure. Um, definitely worth protecting your metadata endpoint. I'm, I'm not sure if you folks heard about it, but the, uh, there was a bank in US, I forget its name, Capital One, I reckon, I think. Um, the recent exploit was the metadata API exploit. So someone jumped on an EC2, which had access to the uh, temporary credentials and then just uh, siphoned off things from S3 bucket. I don't know why people would do that. Everything should, people should, that's illegal, right? That's how people break into stuff. So my recommendation again from this slide, network policies, use them to your advantage. They're native Kubernetes objects. Uh, use them to your advantage. See if you want to. Um, one of the exercises that I've done with customers on network policies is first map out the uh, traffic flow as to if you have a user coming into the cluster, what pods or what APIs or what is the path. And anything outside of the path is how you start blocking with network policies. Now, some general... So, Patrice, there's a Sorry. question from Ash asking about what tools have you used as a quick check to find, do a security check of your cluster, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, good. Oh, sorry, I wasn't paying attention That's to the okay. questions. Yeah, so um, I, I have one of the slides um, later in this as well, but there are some open source tools which plug into, like, say, CIS benchmarks or something like that. There's a tool from Aqua Security called Kubebench, and I think that they have another tool called Cube Hunter. Cube Hunter is the one that goes on and just tries to exploit your cluster. Disclaimer, please do not run Cube Hunter on the clusters you do not own. That's just bad. It's just being bad citizens. Um, if you own clusters and you want to you know, uh, understand the security posture of it, I would recommend leveraging those tools um, to validate some of it. I, I hope that answers uh, the question. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, generally, now this is not any specific object, but general recommendations. Now this here, your mileage may vary, uh, but what I have uh, seen in the past, if you're an organization um, which is very tight on you know uh, regulations or controls or whatever, private masters is the way to go generally, um, because you don't want that Kubernetes API exposed to the public internet. Or even if you do, make it make sure that it's firewalled off and is 
you have restricted access uh, allowed to those API calls. So it's in the past, I've, I've, I've been to organization where a general response was, I, I would ask the question, why is this not private? And people would go, uh, I want to keep CTL uh, apply from my home. I'm like, well and good, but so can multiple million other people's kubectl apply on your cluster. Um, so yeah, your mileage may vary. If, if, if that is something that concerns you, absolutely recommend looking at private masters. I think both the cloud, oh, all the cloud providers support private masters. Um, the only challenge would be then if you, once you go private masters, then how do you access that API? Maybe VPNing in is a solution or maybe, you know, um, talking to, uh, you know, tunneling through some other option is a known way of going about it. Um, API audit logging, I, I cannot recommend this enough. Uh, if you if you are standing up your own cluster, let's say COPS, Cube Spray, or EKS, or GKE, or whatever, make sure that you have a, a funnel going in from your Cube logs, uh, Cube API logs, uh, um, and then siphon it into some sort of a log aggregation tool, which is analyzing those logs um, constantly. Uh, more often than not, when in multiple cases in the past, when I put a Kubernetes cluster on internet, um, all of a sudden you will see there are 401 unauthorized access or um, some uh, weirdness that shows up in those logs. Um, you need that kind of stuff because you can build all of uh, all the protection, but you still need to um, monitor it or maybe look at the logs as to it is behaving the way it is, you expected it to. Um, and if you can, if you are on cloud providers and if you can uh, use a stripped down AMI or a SOE, like in a standard operating environment for your work nodes, that's heavily recommended. You do not want your work nodes to have useless uh, binaries or APIs, which which I know that there's no point of running those binaries on those work nodes. So if you can use a stripped down version of an uh, AMI, generally cloud providers do provide a COS, uh, container operating system, uh, which you can run on with your uh, clusters, that will suffice. But yeah, investigate, don't just go, you know, Ubuntu or CentOS, full blown OSs with full blown um, binaries in there. Uh, and yeah, regular patching. I think that that's just, I thought I'll mention it, but yeah, make sure that your OSs are patched on a regular basis. Um, next one, yeah. Yeah, so th this is again, you can see this, this is mostly, I've already talked to you folks about all the advice I generally give to uh, enterprises or folks, uh, but yeah, pipeline everything. There's, I mean, in this day and age, there should be no need for, you know, um, use manual applying of your deployments or manually building out your clusters, pipeline everything and have that pipelining from the get go of it. Uh, one of the reasons I recommend this is uh, in the past myself, when when uh, when we were starting off on Kubernetes, um, we didn't have a pipeline going in and I used to break the shit out of those, I mean, break those clusters on a very often schedule just because it wasn't pipeline and you wouldn't know which cluster you're authenticated to. And the second use case is um, if you have malicious actors within your organization or somehow they have access um, to your credentials, if, you, if, you, if, you, if your users have elevated privileges all the time, they might be able to cause certain harm. So trust your pipelines or you know, build the pipelines in a way that you trust them um, and you know, remove all the privileges from the people. Um, lastly, I would say is, yeah, the native secrets management on Kubernetes, um, it's it's by default, it's not secure. Um, have a look into things like Vault or Seal Secrets, if you will. Seal Secrets is good, a product by Bitnami. Um, um, Vault, obviously, HashiCorp Vault is brilliant as well. So have a look into those if that's um, where you folks are interested in. Moving on, and I've, I do realize I'm waffling on a bit, but I'll try to speed things up now. Um, so those were all the things that we discussed and all the recommendations that I gave you are just native Kubernetes, right? Um, they're all uh, things that you can do today with your cluster without having to you know, um, do much, like install new parts. Uh, one, there's there's another element of it when 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 I was you know going through this whole exercise of securing Kubernetes from for last few years, native objects have a limitation to an end, and there's 
that's where the OSS side starts to, uh, you know, really augment or uh, uh, complement uh, Kubernetes. So one of the first tools, and this is the key takeaway for me, if you folks can, um, one of the very, very interesting tools, and this is a new kid on the block as well, is Gatekeeper OPA. Uh, OPA is Open Policy Agent, and I say new, it's not that new. Um, I say uh, Open Policy Agent is what <clears throat> is 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 a way you um, write your policies in Regos. If you look at my screen, that on right there is this bit. Oh, didn't mean to do that. There's this bit of, uh, of Rego in here. This is a um, OPA native language or new language, Rego, or as we say in Australia, Rego, um, um, which you can quite literally define your policy. So let's say if your uh, if your security policies a policy is all of my uh, pods need to have a label X or Y or type of item string or whatever. You can just write that five lines of Rego, which will, uh, because given Gatekeeper is an admission controller uh, or Gatekeeper OPA is an admission controller, whenever somebody tries to do a deployment, this would be run against that. And if it doesn't pass your check, it will fail the admission and it will block the deployment. Now you can see where I'm going with this. Like you, if you if you come up, if you threat model your Kubernetes cluster and you come up with six or seven policies, all of those, or not six and seven, even if 50, all of those policies can be automated via this mechanism. You can write a rego for everything that you want to, you know, um, uh, enforce as a policy and then just get, get a gatekeeper to handle it. Gatekeeper is as, as it says on the tin, it literally sits on the gate and says, hey, you don't conform to my policies, I'm not letting you do this. Um, and you can enforce compliance across your enterprise by doing this if you're you know interested in this kind of uh, uh, operation. Um, a second one is container scanning. Now I love the folks at Sysdig. They are they have been doing some absolutely brilliant work. And Sysdig Falco is is really I love that tool as well. Uh, but I'm not here to you know promote Sysdig. But what I'm here to tell you is when you run containers on your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, when you run deploy these containers, you need to make sure your containers are uh, not are vulnerability free at all times. Or even if they have a vulnerability, you want to pick that up as soon as you can. So you can run something like Sysdig in your production Kubernetes cluster or in your Kubernetes cluster. It will constantly look at you know uh, vulnerabilities within all the, the containers that are deployed. And you don't have to manually or go and inspect, oh, I'm running L point, L point, Alpine 3.1. These are the CVs that got, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, released. Am I vulnerable? Sysdig will do all of that for you. And it will provide that kind of report. Now, there are certain features which are in a paid to version are much more advanced and really slick, but open source will do enough for you as well. Um, and same goes for not just only runtime, you want to scan your during your pipelines as well when you build your images, when you try to deploy, and you also want to continuously uh, scan your registries. Now, if you are with a cloud provider like AWS or G GCP, their registries can run a con continuous scan. Um, but if you're running your own harbor or whatever, you can use things like Anchor as well uh, to do that scan for you. Um, about these are, in, sorry. From Ash, just what are the overheads like for using Sysdig? That's a very interesting question. So uh, I have uh, run a few tools in the past, like Aqua Security, Twist CLI, and Sysdig Falco. Um, I don't remember the specific numbers, apologies, um, but it it it... It, it is it does not sit in the pathway of your uh, container or your execution or user traffic uh, but there is there is some CPU and memory impact on the node so they will obviously they run as a container so they will choose some of your CPU and memory but they do not sit in the pathway of your uh, um, um, or on your request flow if you will so your end user may not see any impact now there is a mode in which you can run these tools um, where they're intercepting all the Docker uh, commands as well. Uh, for some of these tools, you can disable or choose not to run that. And if you disable that, the overhead reduces even further. So apologies, I know that's not a concrete answer in terms of numbers, uh, but 
that's that's vaguely what I've seen. Cystic Falco has been the most performant of them all. We've had one of the guys from the audience uh, there, uh, Theo, is saying it's about 5% or so. So it's very low. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, Theo is there. And he says oh. that you're owing 20 bucks uh, for plugging <laughs> it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes the other way. He owes me 100 because I have his logo in here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, sounds good. Uh, but yeah, uh, container scanning. Now, the reason I want to mention container scanning, it, it, and it feeds into a broader thing, is what you want to do is make sure your supply chain, the way you deliver these containers into your Kubernetes environment is trusted. Um, you want to make sure all the containers, all the images that pass through your supply chain have been scanned for vulnerabilities, have been scanned for um, code vulnerabilities as well. And this, this in itself, that's a, um, that's a topic on its own, which um, I'm happy to deep dive later. But just a moving on. Critique. What, what if you're yeah. using, what, what's the value of container scanning if you're using something like Scratch and uh, statically linked binaries where you can, right? And yes, I have a thing about this. Yeah, no, so I think uh, that's a fair point. If you're using things like Scratch or DistroLess, um, yes, there might not be um, much value out of those scans in pipelines, but in some cases you might not be able to, like for instance, if you want to just run, um, let's say, Istio containers, or if you want to run your own Java application, which somehow needs 5,000 uh, other binaries as well, or node modules, I'm, yeah, I'm just, yeah. sorry, I'll just take a dig. Um, but in some cases, you might not be able to. Yes, and for distroless and scratch, yep, it's okay to skip uh, um, the container scanning. But in that case as well, when you're building your own code, I would still recommend you doing uh, a level of software composition analysis, uh, scanning, doing an SCS scan, which tells you, okay, the binaries or that you build is vulnerability free. There is no uh, vulnerability in your libraries and things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still doing the source code scanning and. Presumably, yeah. even then, something like Sysdig could still do a repository scan for you as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you would, I, I would say, having tools like Sysdig running in uh, Sysdig Falco running in your runtime, it's just that level of assurance. Uh, because oh, one of the good features about it, I'm sorry for the plug, I'm not promoting Sysdig, but anyway, um, what you can do is uh, let's say somebody exists into a container or somebody hops onto the node, if you do a file system modification, that actually records and logs that events as well. Um, and that's a, if you go to Sysdig Falco's website, that actually is a demo in their GIF as well. Um, so you should be able to look at that as well. So there are very other, like various use cases why you would want to protect your runtime. Cool, I hope I answered some of those questions. Um, I think we are at the very uh, towards the end of it, but yeah, uh, what this slide is overall trying to say is it's it's well and good to have all of these tools in place, but if you are not doing anything with the information they're producing, like uh, the logs they're producing or the metrics they're producing or the uh, you know the violations they're producing, then there's no point in you know just running these tools. So make sure when you are building out your Kubernetes clusters or you're thinking about building out a strategy for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, have a look at uh, your observability around these things as well, how you can ship all of this logging information from something like Six Sysdig into a centralized uh, tool, how you can ship all the um, network traffic flow or how you can capture network traffic flow in something like Weebscope or Kiali, if you will, um, and how you can you know analyze your Cube API log. So do pay a good attention, a very good attention to your observability stack or your observability story and namely observability being metrics, logging, monitoring, and alerting, and all that visualization goodness. And no, this is not a direct of a security tool, but it does play a very big part. Um, isolation, um, again, I, I, as I said about um, um, RBAC previously as well, using RBAC plus namespaces, you can create a perfect sandbox for teams. You can create perfect sandbox for projects or applications where you can restrict the resources they use, you can restrict um, what kind of um, Kubernetes objects they can create. So for instance, one of the resource quota things is you can limit number of services of type load balancer within your cluster. And in the past, what I've done is, um, oh, 
even now, what I generally do when I create a resource quota, there's a cluster-wide resource quota where it says number of services of type load balancer is zero. So all the services are of type cluster IP and there's only one single ingress point. And there are, your mileage may vary, but there are various uh, benefits to doing that. And I think I'll touch on that later on as well. Um, also, in terms of isolation, look at open source tooling like GVisor. Um, they let you do uh, a syscall proxying. So GVisor is actually a, a user space kernel which is written in Golang. And if you if you run that, you can you can actually create a perfect sandbox for your pod. So even if somebody tries to break break out of your container, they won't be able to you know do much damage. Um, and when when you're designing or when you're creating your Kubernetes cluster, think about if you want to you know do uh, isolate your worker nodes as well. Like you want to split out your worker nodes. Generally, I've seen when people start on their Kubernetes journey, this is not much of a concern. But and they go with just one flat um, node pool or VM pool or EC2 instance group. Um, but um, if you have requirements around securing it, I would recommend splitting it out to. Uh, different types of uh, node pools, um, namely one for if you have if you have a publicly exposed API, have an ingress kind of a VM group, have an egress kind of a VM group, an application group in between. The only reason I recommend that is it, it gives you you can do finer grain isolation um, uh, within those groups as well. Um, I think this might be the last recommendation, but yeah, zero trust approach. Now this <clears throat> this leans into um using things like service meshes now you might not want to leverage a service mesh but if you're not leveraging a service mesh today or don't plan to ever think about how you can build the zero trust approach within your cluster like by default uh, the traffic within the kubernetes cluster is not encrypted um so you should definitely look at solving that and when i when i say it is not encrypted what I mean by that is when the traffic terminates on your Nginx or your ingress controller, from there to it hitting your pod, that's an unencrypted uh, path. Um, leveraging, maybe look at terminating directly on your pod. So maybe look at running envoys as sidecars or MTLS within your cluster. There are multiple ways of solving that. But all of those four or five options mean running a service mesh. Um, have a hard look at you know what service mesh you can run. I do not want to recommend Istio, but have a look at it if you will. There are other ones as well, like Linkerd, Hashicorp Vault. Ha oh, not Hashicorp has Console Connect. I think um, they're all good implementations. Whatever fits your use case, whatever you know fits your build, go for it. Um, the last one on this slide is that ingress egress choke point. Have a it's a it's a <clears throat> it's a very interesting way of thinking about traffic ingressing and egressing into your cluster. The only reason, or the couple of reasons you might want to do that is um, when there is something running on your cluster, and let's say by a certain exploit, if I deploy a miner, generally they have a beacon back to home or base or whatever, and they send out information, or information can be siphoned or exfil. Um, if you have an egress choke point where you define your policies uh, um, to, you know, where what egress can go out of your cluster, it gives you that level of protection that, okay, all traffic will go through uh, my controlled policy set. Um, and there's a question which is um, saying reasons for not recommending Istio. No, I do recommend Istio. I was just kind of joking there. Um, uh, Istio is very good, but it has a very, very massive learning curve. And it is also a um, bit of a management um, nightmare. I think it is, and I don't think I know this, it is getting solved with the newer versions of Istio. So I don't know if you folks know, but Istio is moving towards a monolithic model. So previously they had many, many microservices, um, um, API, Citadel, Galley, Mixer, Pilot, all of that. All of that is now getting consolidated into one point, uh, into one thing called Istio D. Um, that's from 1.5 onwards exactly. Um, and it's now moving more towards monolithic model. And I think management of it might become much more easier. There are a, there are a few startups that are doing really well in the Istio space today. Um, yeah. There's one called Aspen Mesh, which is actually pretty cool. It's mm -hmm. 
if you've ever tried to install Istio, it's a pig to get up and running and install it. And then, you know, um, you just, the installation of Aston Mesh is just so much easier. <laughs> I yeah. cannot tell you how easy it is, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And again, look, uh, some of the cloud providers are also going down their own mesh path, uh, like AWS has, um, forgot the name, Thing of Mesh, whatever. Um, and uh, Google is banking a lot on Istio as a managed uh, service as part of their Anthos offering. So yeah, there's a lot of traction behind Istio, but App Istio is not the only solution. Yes, App Mesh, thank you. Um, Istio might not be the only solution. Um, Nice. Oh, Linkerd is very good as well. I like Linkerd. Cool. Moving on. I'll try to wrap this up soon now. Um, yeah, so this was the thing that I mentioned earlier as well. Um, one of the things when I started looking at securing Kubernetes, one of the things was like, where do where the hell do I start? Um, uh, what the hell should I do? Um, so I think the starting point for me was looking at things like CIS benchmarks and NIST references. Those folks, like literally, they keep on updating their benchmarks, and there is a very good consolidated set of uh, controls in CIS, uh, uh, which will give you inspiration to start off with. Um, and you can use tools like KubeBench, which is listed on the slide, um, to run that CIS benchmark against your cluster. Um, and then <clears throat> you can run KubeHunter to just do an exploit uh, of your cluster and figure out what needs to be uh, corrected or what needs to be fixed in terms of your security posture. Um, but again, these are not, so these tools are not a replacement for a, engaging uh, someone as a security consultant or a partner for looking at your uh, setup. Um, in the past, what I've done is when we design these cluster for organizations, we do bring in someone who has more of a pen tester role, if you will, um, then they try to break the living shit out of the cluster. And in some cases they succeed, and we learn, and that's effectively how I've learned. Uh, but in some cases, you know, it comes back, yep, you've got solid security, you're good to go. Um, so I guess in summing up all of what we talked today, even if you think all the recommendations I give, uh, you know, boring and not really useful for your use cases, I, I what I would like you all to take away is some of the principles. And these principles have helped me a lot in the past, and this is not a consolidated list, like there, there are many other principles that you should follow, but always think about defense in depth. There's no, it's not just one solution that will protect you. You need that layer of defense. And what we talked about so far was like having gatekeeper, then you have network policies, then you have pod security policies. All of those are different layers. And if somebody wants to actually break in, they would have to break through all the layers. So think about defense in depth. Um, it's not just defense at edges, it's all defense in depth all the way. Um, I cannot emphasize how important it is to build a trusted supply chain. If your supply chain, which is what a CI CD pipeline is, if it is doing all the checks and balances and you can hook into tools like Graphius or Critis, um, they're open source uh, binary provenance tools. Um, but if your supply chain is producing artifacts which you trust, then it it goes a long way on just you know code compile and then running on the cluster. Um, from and any security consultant will tell you this: trust but verify. Um, even if you trust something, always verify that it is what it is. I think there's no harm. Sorry, man. I, I think provenance is a huge one that um, people underestimate a lot. Yeah. Um, if you think about if I think of the, the canonical example being airlines, right? Um, yeah. Boeing and all these other companies that make aeroplanes, they track every nut, every bolt through its life cycle when it's installed in an aeroplane, how many hours it's done, all of these things, right? Every component that goes into it is tracked and validated, right? Whereas um, for our images we don't tend to do that we don't tend to do that with our source code we don't do it with the images we build and we probably should you know yeah oh spot on spot on um google open sourced i think graph graphs and critters a uh, while back ago um and they have a native offering called binary authorization where in your trust in your uh, supply chain 
when you're building out code, you constantly attest uh, to this centralized service saying, yep, this code was fine, this thing was fine. And when you deploy that binary into Kubernetes, there's an admission controller which goes, oh, hey, uh, service, or oh, oh, hey, uh, Docker image. It takes that char, goes to the attestation service and go, is this binary trusted? And then that service will go, yep, I have all the attestations, go for it. I, I cannot emphasize how important it is to do that um, because you never know um, when you're running code or when you're running containers, what vulnerability may be introduced where. And you want to make sure everything is deployed exactly to your standard. And again, it helps in automating some of the release aspects, right? You don't have to go through paper-based process saying, yep, approve, take. Literally, I used to work in an organization where uh, I had to print out the SHA of my uh, Java binaries on a blue paper and then get that ticked off by the release manager because they had another white paper. And if the colors were different of the paper, even that was classified as a, a stop release. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> but yeah, some of the other principles is deny by default. And I, I saw somebody mention that as well. Computer says no um, is the first response. Yeah, deny by default. Uh, you don't want, um, uh, whenever you have a violation, you want it to fail close. Don't fail open. Unfortunately, the gatekeeper, the tool that I mentioned currently is a fail open scenario, but there are ways around it. Um, automate your security policies. Uh, like there is no reason today to not codify your security requirements or not codify your security practices. And just get on with it, write OPA policies, get gatekeepers and things like that. And threat model your use case. Like all the things that I mentioned to you today, I've learned by threat modeling use cases with various enterprises. Um, it's it's a it's a good primer for you, but I hope this these are pointers you you folks can go away with, and threat model your own environment, come up with more interesting use cases and policy is code. Final one, um, and I think oh I have a conclusion slide as well. Yeah, and I think in conclusion, security is everybody's responsibility. It can't be just a security engineer or person whose title is security. So everybody has to contribute. And given now this ecosystem is so. Um, it has got so much uh, collaboration or so much uh, codification going on. Everybody should be able to collaborate. And there's really a lot and lots of open source tooling to help us out with. Um, and I think on that note, that's pretty much it. So thanks everyone for your time. Any questions? I guess not. I was just absolutely brilliant on everybody's sleeping. For take. That was that was awesome and everyone's saying it's a good talk. There is a question I can see. One moment. Yep. Ah, oh, that's an interesting one. Yes. Yeah, so um sorry. Scott, go, no, just, go for it, man. Yeah. So yeah, um a DSV is a, a an interesting one. Oh sorry, what, what the question is asking for is signing Docker images. And I, I if I'm not mistaken, that's talking about DSV, which is digital signature verification. Um, so Docker has a tool called Notary. Uh, you can run Notary servers, and I have explored it a bit. I don't, I wouldn't say it's my favorite tool, but yes, it is the tool that I have leveraged at some of the organizations for DSV. How often the cluster? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, Regularly. Re yeah, <laughs> I was going to say there's it's it's it. it with with everything as code, there should be no way you do it once or twice or whatever, or mm. you know you have a sprint dedicated for hardening. It's a constant effort. Every single feature you ship should be hardened, should have security policies against it, uh, should marry up with your uh, all the threat modeling exercise. Anything that puts um, your customer as risk is just not acceptable these days with all the things. So I would say, yeah, all the time. The more often you do it, the less painful it is to rip the Band-Aid off when you need to change something, right? So oh, as part of deployment, right? Absolutely spot on.